This video talks about a lot of different pieces of media. If you are spoiler sensitive, I've written out details of exactly what's discussed for each title in the description. It's also timestamped. This is an essay about catastrophe and death and despair and hope and two dozen other things. But first, there's a moment from the Bahamut fight in Final Fantasy 16 that I really want to talk about. I mean, who am I kidding? There are lots of moments in that fight I want to talk about. It's a boss that takes 45 minutes to whittle down with some of the most gonzo action put on screen in recent memory. There are mother crystals reforming, a whole on rail section, music that's going appropriately bananas. But in the uh, fourth or fifth or sixth phase of the battle, there's this one thing that happens that I keep thinking about. See, Bahamut, this big creature you're fighting, has a series of flare-based attacks. Mega Flare, its smallest, is a destructive missile barrage. Giga Flare, the next step up, is basically an orbital laser strike. Terra Flare, a tactical nuke. And these continue to escalate as the fight launches into literal space. Finally, Bahamut becomes so desperate to win, he pulls out his last big trick, Zeta Flare. And our protagonist takes one look at Zeta Flare and says the line, he would burn the world! And then you win the fight. You push Square really fast and push through the charging Zeta Flare and totally own Bahamut. It's big, climactic, and very cool. It's also weirdly just the middle of the game. That's funny, right? The plot of Final Fantasy XVI ultimately has to do with some other big world-ending guy, and you spend hours getting to know him and stoically discussing all his motivations. But here, for all of 30 seconds, there's a threat that's just as big. He would burn the world, we yell, the entire Earth below us in a sudden pre-apocalypse. Every character, every motivation, every plot point immediately in mortal peril from Bahamut's one big last attack. And then, it's over. The stakes defeated as quickly as they were raised. The pre-apocalypse is done. Get moving to the next one. It's not an unusual moment for the Final Fantasy series, or even for media in general. God knows how many times we've seen the world on the brink of destruction averted by the heroic acts of some main character. Many times, the world doesn't even know how close it came to being destroyed. It's the heavy burden of the hero alone to know just how near everyone was to oblivion. For a story like this to function, it needs a couple things. A hero, for one, a Clive, a superhero, a James Bond. It also needs an extinction event that is eminently defeatable. Bahamut is the whole end of the world here. You beat him, you cancel the apocalypse. And often, you need a story largely uninterested in what the end of the world would have actually meant. We get one line. He would burn the world to sum up everything, everyone dying forever. And I get it, because you give total annihilation more than a line, and it will swallow your story whole. No single moment can exist outside of it. In 1957, Neville Shute published On the Beach, a novel that is, in many ways, inextricable from its geopolitical context. In the years before the book's release, the US and the Soviet Union both detonated hydrogen bombs hundreds of times more powerful than Hiroshima. As the book was written, the accelerating space race implied the ability to shoot missiles across the world. When it was published, the USSR had over 500 nuclear weapons, the US over 5,000. Naturally, On the Beach is about the end of the world. It's not about explosions, though, or at least they're not given the spotlight. Instead, the book's tone is foreshadowed by its epigraph, a few lines from the poem The Hollow Men by T.S. Eliot. You've almost certainly encountered this poem before, though you may not know it. This is the way the world ends. This is the way the world ends. Not with a bang, but you know the one. On the Beach's plot is defined by a war we never see. 
We get sparse details. It lasted 37 days. It was between Russia, China, the US, Egypt, the UK. And it ended after only a month because of the use of cobalt bombs, nukes specifically designed to produce radiation to poison the air and ground. The nukes worked in that almost immediately the northern hemisphere made itself dead and uninhabitable. And on the beach, however, all of this is just incidental conversation. The book's narrative is only possible because it's set almost entirely in Australia, a country not involved in the war and thus not irradiated yet. But all the characters know that in an indeterminate number of months, the radiation from the north will blow down over Australia, blanketing their continent in poison too, an inescapable death they can see coming thousands of miles away. It's a dread that swallows the story whole. And yet, On the Beach is a fascinating book because you wouldn't have to excise that many pages to remove the nuclear threat from its plot entirely. For the majority of its length, people live remarkably boring lives. A couple plays with their baby and prepares the garden for next year. An American Navy member meets a young woman and spends time with her, but he's married, so they don't do anything intimate. A scientist buys a sports car and finds that he loves racing. Shoot has a resolutely matter-of-fact writing style. We're given few glimpses into the internal lives of characters, and even events of major importance rarely get more than a sentence. But because the end of the world is inevitably drifting towards them, everything becomes morbidly fascinating. Why would Mary be planting flower bulbs that won't come up until next year? Why would Dwight, the American Navy officer, buy a fishing rod for his son? Why would he consistently reference returning to his wife when his family was in a major U.S. city when the bombs hit. Delusional isn't quite the word to describe the characters of On the Beach. They often recognize that their behavior is irrational. Instead, I think Shoot makes clear that they simply don't know how else to act. What is the logical time to stop your daily routine? What concretely do you change when confronted with a six-month countdown. On one of the few excursions out of Australia, a group of Navy sailors take a submarine to Seattle, Washington. There's nothing left of practical use, but the city itself remains, and one of the sailors jumps overboard and swims to the radioactive shore. The crew finds him hours later, fishing in a rowboat. You can picture how this scene would work in a different book, the deserters stark raving mad, the crew screaming for him to come back inside. But none of that happens here. There's no antipathy, no sense of betrayal, not even any confusion. He just chose a slightly different finish line than everyone else. The conflict of the story isn't really experienced by any of the characters, at least not externally. But it's felt omnipresent by us, the reader, a pit in our stomach as a character blithely references all her friends having babies, a morbid understanding when an amateur car race results in multiple fatalities. The hook of On the Beach is seeing how the everyday warps, becomes beautiful or grotesque when framed by the end of days. The last character swallows poison while watching the waves. No amount of heroism can avert it. Much of On the Beach can't be separated from its 1950s publication date, the specific shape of the apocalypse, for example, or its particular brand of domesticity. But many more parts of the book feel timeless. Its yearning for normality in the face of catastrophe doesn't feel remotely dated. Earlier this year, Scavenger Studios released Season, A Letter to the Future. It is not a game about THE world ending, but it is a game about A world ending. And its cataclysm, gentle, green, quiet, runs both parallel and perpendicular to On the Beach. In the opening narration, Season's protagonist explains that this season, understood as not just a couple months, but an entire era of the world, is about to end, that the world will be turned inside out. Seasons are 
somewhat event-based, somewhat generational. There are older folks who remember a season of war or a bliss called the Golden Season. But this one, a season that doesn't even have a name yet, seems different. It doesn't feel like it's going to flow naturally into the next, but slice the world into a before and after, an after that's robbed of the remnants of any previous era. Our job, therefore, is to record, not avert. This is an immediate consistency between season and on the beach. The end is a foregone conclusion. But unlike on the beach, there's this idea that someone will be there to look back on the before someday. Our character, Estelle, is making a trek to the Museum Vault, which she describes as a palace of art and memory at the edge of the Earth, a place that can survive whatever's about to happen. But the museum isn't built to shelter humans. Instead, Estelle will be bringing a scrapbook to the vault, a scrapbook built from your experience of the game. She says that through her scrapbook, this time on Earth could live on, what it looks like, sounds like, how it feels to be alive right now. What that means is up to each player. And like On the Beach, it's a story free from almost any of the conflict you might expect. No one grows violent at the end, no one outwardly breaks down. But unlike Shoot's novel, this is true in part because most don't know the full scale of the change that's coming. Most of the game takes place in the Tiang Valley, a valley that in only hours will be flooded by a group called the Grey Hands. This is the known apocalypse. We find people in various stages of packing and memorialization for the home they'll soon have to leave. What vanishingly few of them are aware of is the second apocalypse, the greater one that will accompany the flood. They will simply forget everything. The second apocalypse is an apocalypse of memory, brought on by a prayer to the god of forgetting, an apocalypse that will wipe out the legacy of seasons past, just as the flood will wipe out its structures. See, where previous seasons' vibes were golden, or war, we eventually learn that this season's overwhelming feeling is haunted. Haunted by the war, haunted by the bliss of seasons past, haunted by memories which have literally crystallized gems that jut out of the ground and whisper to anyone who cares to listen. And so the Grey Hands are orchestrating the destruction of both land and mines in order to move forward, in order to escape this haunting. But because no one knows they're about to lose their history, because even Estelle has no aspirations of stopping the change in season, the environment of the game is contemplative, peaceful, almost polite. Everything stands still and waits for you to record it. Predictably, I took a lot of photos of sunrises and sunsets. I tried to capture the ramshackle art people made out of scrap metal, but accurately capturing the tenor of an entire era in photos and sketches and a few audio tapes feels hopeless. Estelle writes, I tried to divide the things I see between two categories, permanent and impermanent, but the division breaks down. The difference is just a feeling. The game ends, where else? On the beach. Estelle sets out on a boat as a vibrant shockwave rolls across the water. It annihilates her memories. She doesn't turn around to see what on the shore remains. I wonder how possible it is to truly eliminate a haunted era. I think back to a note Estelle wrote earlier in the scrapbook. What we do to the land eventually makes its way into our blood and our brains. In any case, the scrapbook survives. This we know, because just before the credits, a researcher in the far future reads her words in the museum vault and then steps out into a bright glass city. It's a somewhat strange note to conclude on. The world survives, thrives even. It literally looks like the meme template. I think the game wants us to consider if it was worth it, the exchange of all history and culture for a tabula rasa to build the future upon. 
But the fact that the future is as bright and shiny as we see suggests that this total annihilation is a valid strategy, you know? It's saying that it works. And because of that, Season's tone comes off as a little mournful, a little commemorative, and a little resigned to this being just how history goes. Do your best to remember with your scrapbook, because everything else will be washed away and that's the price of progress. On the beach's lack of conflict is because we know there's no after, not for humans anyway, it is a 300 page funeral procession. But in season, Estelle is being actively denied a future by other living, decision-making humans in the plot. Where is her anger at being forced to exist in the pre-apocalypse? Where's her rage? Where's- Umurangi Generation was released by Origami Digital in May of 2020. Umurangi is a word in Te Reo, a language spoken by less than 200,000 people, almost all of them in the indigenous Maori population of New Zealand. Umurangi means red sky. It's a hint at the meaning of the title, a meaning that's eventually spelled out in the credits. Dedicated to the Umurangi Generation, the last generation who has to watch the world die. I've started at the end, because that's what the game does as well, the end of everything, the red sky generation. But even though it's all the end, you might not pick up on it at first. The first level feels pretty blissed out, actually. You and your friends vibing on a rooftop skate park, artsy graffiti thrown across every wall. Your only job is to take pictures of your friends and particular objects and the mountain in the distance. It is, like Season, a game about capturing things through your camera. It is, unlike Season, a game furious with the fate it's been handed. The particular shape of the apocalypse in Umurangi is actually closer to Final Fantasy than the other examples we've discussed thus far, because it's kaiju. Part of the fun of your first playthrough is gradually recognizing what the hell is going on, because the first levels have UN bunkers and lockdowns and brands taking advantage of dystopia, and then later levels have monsters and combat and actual f***ing Evangelion skyscraper-sized mechs walking around. It is, even just superficially, an extremely cool escalation. And with this greater understanding of global events, I initially assumed the tone was almost on the beachy. It's the end of the world as we know it, and I feel fine. Because your friends are freaking chillin', you know? Umarangi really traffics in punk aesthetics, cool hair and clothes and kick-ass music, and maybe, I thought, part of the punkness was a perpetual state of apathy. Not even as a judgment, really, just like on the beach, that sense of wanting to spend their last days in a way that's comfortable. But I was wrong. Because what Umarangi has, a thing I retroactively felt the absence of in our other examples, is palpable disgust with the world of before, anger at the injustice that fed into that red sky. Naftali Faulkner, the game's director, has talked explicitly about the inspirations for this game. Umarangi's red skies were born from the red skies of Australia during the bushfires of late 2019 and early 2020, an inferno that burnt 94,000 square miles, killed dozens of people and a billion animals. And like the game's kaiju, it's easy to think of those bushfires as an unfortunate but unavoidable calamity. No one could have stopped Australia from burning, the radiation from poisoning the atmosphere, the changing of the seasons, the emergence of the kaiju. It's a convenient platitude, makes us feel okay. It's a lie. The villain of Umarangi Generation aren't the enormous jellyfish monsters stomping around the environment, just as the villain of the Australian bushfires isn't the chemical reaction that causes plants to burn. Instead, both fictional and real-life disasters are the fault of leaders and oligarchs that ushered in the disaster, an apocalypse labeled uncontrollable only after years of ignoring the very clear steps to control it. Now, 
I don't know the exact lore of Umaranki Generation. I don't know if, for instance, 45 years before the events of the game, corporations calculated that their own actions would cause the advent of kaiju, and then did nothing. I don't know if the politicians of Umarangi Generation claimed that kaiju were impossible until they were so unignorable they shifted to saying the mass death caused by kaiju was part of God's plan. I do know that the wealthiest, the bourgeois of Umarangi Generation, shelter languorously in billion dollar cathedrals to denial while the vulnerable are forced out under the red sky. And I know that even while the kaiju set the world ablaze. The government spent untold billions sicking its dogs on the people demanding action. The last level of the game isn't destruction by a kaiju, it's being concussed by a cop while the world outside burns. It's also here that the game's themes of indigeneity are most pointed. Faulkner has talked about how the game's entire design ethos stems from a school of thought pioneered by an Australian professor of indigenous knowledge. In the game, places are labeled with their Maori names, graffiti of traditional iconography covers the walls, a trio of NPCs perform a haka at a protest. But it's hard not to also feel themes of native identity in the constant sense of injustice, in the fact that the new government will beat you while letting the earth they stole die. There is no apathy here. Meditative calm at the end of the world is a mind trick that preserves the status quo. Umurangi cares about the pre-apocalypse. Umurangi is pissed. It's a tough line to walk. I understand. To have the characters rant about nuclear proliferation and on the beach would have felt artificial. Their consequences were foregone. And although the text of the novel doesn't explicitly say this is why we should get rid of nukes, you don't have to dig too far and shoot story to find that message. I'm reminded of the 1980 arcade classic Missile Command. Developed at, stop me if you've heard this one, the height of the Cold War, a time when the US and the USSR had a total of 50,000 nuclear bombs, Missile Command is essentially the prequel to On the Beach a game set just pre-apocalypse, where missiles fall down in an endless rain and your task is to shoot them out of the sky, a game where the only conclusion is the destruction of every city you're supposed to protect. The only conclusion is failure. Dave Thoyer, the creator of this game, was overwhelmed by this concept. Any sound of a plane in the distance became the initial blast wave of an atomic bomb. When he closed his eyes, he saw San Francisco annihilated. Thoyer was not delusional. He was living in the pre-apocalypse. The fact that this pre-apocalypse was averted does not make his nightmares irrational. Post-apocalypse is easy. When the great defining event of the world is in the rearview mirror, characters in post-apocalyptic stories are free to grapple with smaller, more individual crises. What are they going to do? unexplode the bombs, unscorch the earth. Setting a story in the pre-apocalypse presents characters with similarly impossible challenges, but this time the stakes are so high that to not do anything would be morally contemptible, right? Clive has a moral obligation to stop Zeta Flare, doesn't he, when the alternative is a burned world? Paul Schrader's 2017 film First Reformed imagines a world on the brink of a mass extinction event, one brought on by a cabal of depraved oil executives, enabled by both state legislation and state violence. When the protagonist, a pastor, realizes that some of those executives will gather together in his church, it's impossible for him to escape the idea that maybe it's his ethical duty, maybe the only reasonable choice to... Andreas Malm's 2021 book, How to Blow Up a Pipeline, is a non-fictional book of political theory that was adapted into Daniel Goldhaber's 2022 fictional film of the same name. The book is not instructional in the chemical sense its title implies. Rather, it imagines a world that has seen protests of tens, thousands, millions of people against the pre-apocalypse, and yet the wheels roll as fast as ever. 
We are still here, Malm writes. We march, we block, we stage theaters, we hand over lists of demands to ministers, we chain ourselves, we march the next day too. We are still perfectly, immaculately peaceful. There are more of us now, by orders of magnitude. There is another pitch of desperation in our voices. We talk of extinction and no future, and still, business continues very much as usual. At what point do we escalate? When do we conclude the time has come to also try something different? When do we start? The film captures a number of people from different states and backgrounds, all already scarred by the pre-apocalypse, all brought together by the unignorable moral demand to... They do not blow up the pipeline, the world's pipeline, the global network of all fossil fuel. They do not in a single act save the world. They do not cast the climate disaster into the same category of almost annihilations as the Cold War. But they do not politely wait for that pre-apocalypse to become post, either. It's not hard to find connections between the two stories. But First Reformed is a story about despair. It is a story about the ideated destruction of self, the fantasy of a Christ-like rescue of the world through death and suffering. Its despair is seductive, relatable, selfish. How to Blow Up a Pipeline, both the fiction and non-fiction, are instead about anger and about hope. Its focus is not on pain or imminent death, but process, about the reasons to not lay down and let the tide swallow us whole. This is also the focus, I should add, of a truly beautiful YouTube video released last month by Sophie from Mars titled, The World Is Not Ending. I find it so easy to think poetically of the world as one giant beach, one in which all of us stand and wait for the clouds of radiation to roll in. I wander through the world, attempting to capture what feels valuable, trying to record the things I hope to pass on. All the art I create is, in one way or another, art about the pre-apocalypse. I look into the future, and one fate seems so much likelier than all others. And yet, as Malm writes, to act politically is to reject probability assessment as a ground for action. To resign ourselves to the disaster on the horizon just because that's the direction inertia carries us is an act of monumental apathy. It is easier, at least for some, to imagine learning to die than learning to fight. We will not be the Umurangi generation, literally, because there is already a generation that is coming after us, and our choice, as is the choice of every generation, is whether to make the world contain more or less suffering. This is the great trial of being alive right now. It is necessary for all of us to view ourselves accurately in the pre-apocalypse. And yet, because of this, it is also absolutely vital to imagine and work and dream of a world that is different. Before you go, there are two things I want you to know about this sponsor read. One, I am giving all the money I'm making from it away. Two, Nebula is doing a pretty wild thing for only this month. Let's talk about those things in order. First, I am splitting what Nebula is paying me this month between two organizations, Extinction Rebellion and the Indigenous Environmental Network. These are, I think, two branches of the same absolutely vital fight. Apathy is not an option, not even in sponsor reads. I'm able to make this kind of donation because Nebula has already created a healthier ecosystem for creators like me. Every person who signed up for Nebula using my link in the past is partially responsible for my financial security, which now allows me to give a bunch of money to organizations doing something real. Second, this is where things get kind of juicy. Nebula is offering for this month only a lifetime membership. Instead of a subscription, it's a one-time payment that will get you everything Nebula offers forever. If you're new here, what Nebula offers includes tons of exclusive videos from me, original series from your favorite people, movies, plays, classes, more. 
Do you know I just recorded a podcast where I talked to freaking Noah Caldwell Gervais about The Last of Us for an hour and a half? That'll be dropping later this month only on Nebula. Or head over there to see a comprehensive look at how I make a video from script conceptualization to handling Adobe Premiere timelines, or a full original essay on The Darkness 2 or multiple very silly cooking videos, or any number of other things. The normal subscription to Nebula is still the cheapest, easiest option. This lifetime thing? It's really an experiment. I have no idea if Nebula will ever do it again. In either case, you will be joining what I think is a genuinely wonderful service. You'll be enabling me to make more art and remain financially stable. And look, there's a good chance this video might just disappear from YouTube at some point. I mean, do you know how many times I said the phrase, how to blow up a pipeline? I'm sure I'm already on some sort of watch list.